Yeah, that's what happened. Well, um, delighted that we have uh, Dr. Manish Gupta with us uh, for our um, invited speaker series. Uh, Manish is a distinguished uh, principal applied scientist at Microsoft India. Um, he got his degree from the University of Illinois and before that, um, IIT Bombay. And um, he has more than 100 um, publications. Uh, I've uh, seen his very informative, um, uh, you know, YouTube channel. Uh, a lot of, um, you know, things where, a lot of uh, videos where he discuss papers as well as some tutorials. Um, is, uh, and, and that uh, he's, he's also serves as adjunct faculty at Diplomatic uh, Hyderabad and a visiting faculty at Institute of um, ISV, which is the major Indian School of Business. Yeah. So, Marish, uh, out to you. Uh, delighted. Uh, this topic is of very good interest to us also. And uh, I, the paper was fantastic. So, take over. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, Professor Amit. Uh, um, I mean, on multiple counts, uh, I'm really honored uh, to be sort of presenting this at the AI Institute uh, seminar uh, at USC. And of course, thanks so much for the great introduction. Uh, uh, I'll get started. Uh, so uh, I'll talk today about multimodal brain encoding and decoding, but a little bit more detail uh, about uh, what are my current areas of interest and what am I doing? Uh, I have uh, tried to define current as since January 2022, and uh, I think I'm uh, first of all I'm pretty uh, pretty yeah. fortunate and uh, pretty yeah. grateful to the awesome collaborators that I've had across these institutes in India, um, and looking to expand my collaboration base as much as I can uh, take it. Uh, recently, I have been focusing on cognitive neuroscience. Uh, really because of some collaborators. I mean, uh, I'm not really a traditional cognitive neuroscience person, but uh, some of my collaborators, including some students, actually just have uh, pushed me uh, to do well in this field. Uh, we have had papers on speech neuroscience uh, recently, you know, just just presented yesterday at Interspeech uh, and also a previous one at ICASP. We have uh, given tutorials. Uh, you know, one of them in HKI 2023 happened just a few days back. And uh, previously, it also was uh, was done at IGCNN and COGSAI. Uh, we have been also doing things in multimodal neuroscience, which is what the today's focus could be. And we have also been looking at NLP-based neuroscience uh, with syn studying syntactic structure and NLP tasks. Uh, besides neuroscience, I do a whole bunch of things on NLP. So yeah. cross lingual text generation. So where uh, uh, you know um, there was a government project, Indian government project, about trying to enrich Indian Wikipedia pages. And which is what led to these publications around uh, uh, factually grounded uh, cross-lingual context, uh, cross-lingual text generation, or fact-to-text uh, generation. Um, you know, um, using encyclopedia, uh, encyclopedic text as well. Right. So that's that. Um, so um, uh, another stream of work is around dialogue systems. So this is a collaboration with IIT Kharagpur where we were we were trying to come up with a better with loss function. Better or dialogue models, and another one with IIT Delhi, where we were trying to come up with the multimodal dialogue systems. So, you know, this is really fun work where we were trying to actually guess what would uh, uh, Dennis yeah. say in a particular comic, right? Or what would Garfield say? Now, well, Garfield doesn't say much, but, you know, any cartoon character say when they're introduced in another comic. So that's basically uh, that, that work. Uh, uh, you know, uh, my day job is at Microsoft, where I actually work in the Bing query autosuggest team. And uh, therefore, you know, we we have done some tutorials around that, and also collaborated uh, to uh, come up with some publications in that area as well. Besides this, yes, I have like extensive interest. I'm actually more wowed by the problems rather than the area. So therefore, you know, I have some sort of recent works on retrieval-based visual question answering, news question answering, um, visual table to text, uh, or even building uh, domain-specific models like for tourism. Uh, and fortunately, with good collaborators and great students. So that's the background of what I've been doing. And uh, now I'll sort of start with today's work, right? Uh, introduction to multimodal brain encoding, decoding. And then I'll talk about two of these things that we recently did. So as to really understand how does our brain process multimodal information, right? That's basically the goal um, to do these things. Um, so let's talk about multimodal, uh, you know, brain encoding, decoding, and uh, starting really from the basics, right? So what is this brain encoding field or what is brain decoding? So 
Brain encoding is a super simple process. And in fact, this is how I understood almost like five, six years back when somebody told me, hey, there's this nice field called co cognitive neuroscience, right? So brain encoding basically means, you know, taking uh, uh, this stimulus representation, this image, you know, from a deep learning perspective, it's basically like taking an image and then being able to predict um, brain, brain activations, uh, you know, um, uh, as measured by fMRI, right? So there is some guy who was sitting in an fMRI machine, or not sitting, like lying down, lying down in an fMRI machine, and their brain activations were measured. So you basically, uh, they, they, they saw this stimulus and they started thinking. And whatever they were thinking essentially is captured by these brain activations. And the goal of encoding is literally to actually take those, uh, take the image, and then be able to predict those brain activations as much as we can. Now, this could be done either using standard machine learning, so come up with some features based on this image, or by doing deep learning. So take the entire image and somehow, you know, be able to predict what is going on, uh, you know, those brain activations. So that's encoding. But encoding is not enough fun, right? What is fun is decoding. So why is decoding fun? Decoding is fun because decoding is a reverse process. It is basically about, uh, you know, being able to take somebody's fMRI measurements and being able to magically, you know, identify what this guy would have seen. So it is basically like saying, okay, well, I thought about something and you can actually decode and tell me what did I think about. So imagine use cases that this could power. So powering use cases like, hey, I think that I want to call someone and a call happens, right? That's the power of this technology. If basically whenever it matures some research to actual technology, right? So uh, I'm, I'm dreaming something and uh, usually I forget dreams, but no worries. There is a sensor which is sort of continuously monitoring what am I dreaming? And because, well, when you're dreaming, our brains are active. And, you know, I can actually decode them and, uh, you know, read about it in the morning. What did I dream about? Right? So that's that. Um, now, these stimulus measurements are done actually using several uh, techniques and they differ. So these data sets are publicly available and these data sets differ across these types. So fMRI, EEG, MEG, newer technologies coming in, they differ in terms of their spatial resolution, temporal resolution, and so on. Uh, there's also sampling time. So how frequently you take these scans? There are fixation points, so you know, uh, you know, to be able to make the subject focus on what we are trying to show, you know, there are these fixation points and tears in the stimuli. So uh, typically across uh, somewhere, you know, to and they differ in terms of location, color, and shape. Form of stimuli, so you could be presenting text, video, audio, images, and we'll talk about multimodal stimuli today. Task, so you know, if you want to, to measure somebody's brain activation, they should really be thinking about it, right? So for example, so many people might be here, but not thinking about it, unless I tell them that there's a quiz at the end of the seminar. So if you give them a task, people are bound to think more and concentrate more and, and concentrate. give less noisy brain activation recordings. So uh, therefore people are being told to do several tasks as part of these data sets, like question answering, property generation, understanding, um, so that they concentrate more and look at the stimuli that they have been presented with. Uh, time given to the participants, people can be, you know, subjects could be looking at stimuli for a different amount of time and subjects vary in terms of demography, number of times the response was shown and the language in which the stimuli was shown to people. So data sets differ across those. So now there are so many multimodal data sets. Again, this is a seminar on multimodal encoding, decoding. So there are so many multimodal data sets. Uh, of course, traditional multimodal as in video and also non-traditional multimodal, you know, things beyond, beyond video, right? So for example, here is video-based data sets, BBC, Doctor Who's data set, and you know, uh, all of these data sets are actually very recent. So as you see, 2019 onwards, right? multimodality has of course been a recent thing to happen, while just text-based on image-based data sets were very old. I mean, there are studies going all the way 2008, uh, you know, even with uh, recent machine learning kind of concepts. So, and, and these data sets vary in terms of number of subjects. Of course, the number of subjects in these data sets are typically very small. So, you know, max you see here is about 40. Um, and uh, the languages differ as well. So some of them could be Dutch, Swedish, but most of them are English based. Most of them are English based. Uh, typically, most of them are fMRI rather than other kind of uh, variant. Uh, and uh, well, in video data sets here, it was just passive viewing. So folks were doing really nothing but doing passive viewing. Right? So although the number of subjects is so well, as you see, these data sets are not small in the overall scheme of things, if you look at it, because, you know, even with one subject, you could basically be, uh, uh, remember, you're basically trying to measure for every voxel. So you have like lakhs of voxels and across them, you're trying to figure out, um, uh, figure out yeah. the magnitude, right? Yeah. So that's one, that's one thing. And then again, I mean, you know, even these many subjects basically have looked at several different stimuli leading to a reasonably large data set, even though the number of subjects are small. 
Now there are other kinds of forms of multimodal stimuli as well. So besides video and which is what I've listed in this table. So for example, people saw word and picture pairs what? together here or uh, you know, word and line drawings. So these are also pictures, but line drawings rather than real world pictures, realistic real pictures. pictures. Um, so, um, uh, and then, uh, you know, so many of these basically that you see are essentially about uh, words and combined with pictures. Some of them also have word clouds with them. Some of them have line drawings with them and so on, right? So specific uh, of specific interest to us is this Pereira data set, which essentially has uh, words, pictures, sentences, and word clouds. So the combination of kind of data that was kind shown to uh, subjects. And I'll talk in detail about this one because uh, most of our work is actually, much of our work is around that data set. That data set is pretty popular in the community. So uh, typically what people did in the past to process multimodal stimulus is to actually process them uh, using a combination of two modalities rather than processing them in a, in a joint manner. So for example, if, uh, if, if your data set is about video, you would basically use SoundNet to process the audio part and VGG to process the image part. Right. If your data set is an image plus text combination, well, you would use glove embeddings, embeddings to process the text part and VGG, or a VGG kind of models, you know, VGG, DenseNet, ResNet, whatever, to process the image part. Right. But what we did was to sort of start bringing up this notion of actually using multimodal models for processing multimodal stimuli. Right. And that is where our contribution uh, mainly lies, besides, of, of course, also presenting other kind of problem settings. So, with that uh, sort of base built, uh, let me actually get into multi-view and cross-view brain decoding. So these are actually new problem settings that we introduced uh, with a very interesting goal. Um, the interesting goal is, uh, uh, you know, to figure out, the first goal is to figure out that, hey, if I, um, you know, um, I have built a model which basically uh, uh, takes uh, image stimuli that was shown to subjects, and it can predict the brain activations. Okay. So essentially, it's an image-focused model. It takes image stimuli, can predict uh, what kind of image, you know, can predict brain activations, can predict brain activation. This is the encoding model. Okay. So, um, uh, and then, um, you know, um, uh, if I basically take that, and, and then the decoding model, equivalent decoding model is basically, I can take fMRI activations and try to decode what kind of images this guy would have seen. Can I use the same decoding model uh, to take the same fMRI activations and decode what kind of text this guy, you know, whatever image this guy saw, what kind of text does it decode back to? Okay, so that's one. The second kind of thing that I call is cross view. So the idea here is to say the following. Uh, you all know image captioning tasks. So basically, when I give you an image, you all can think about a line, a sentence that describes that image. So when you when I show you an image and I tell you that hey give me a line that describes that image, which part of your brain is activated? That's the question that I am trying to answer here. So cross view brain decoding is about uh, trying to understand when we actually do this uh, cross uh, modal thinking, right? Which parts of our brain are activated? So that's the question that we want to answer in this part. And this is the paper that we presented at Colling um, last year. So for, of course, to do this kind of stuff that how does the brain capture the meaning of let's say linguistic stimuli across multiple views. So by multiple views, I mean the following. For example, if there's a concept called, called bird, you know, this is a sentence view. I could basically show you sentences to sort of make you think about birds. The bird flew around the cage. The only bird she can see is the parrot. I can make you think about bird I can show you these sentences. I can make you think about the bird by showing these pictures. I can make you think about the bird by showing this word cloud, right? There's so many different views uh, around which I can actually present the concept to you. Now, considering these three different concepts, uh, uh, how does the brain capture the meaning of linguistic stimuli across these multiple views? Is there something like a unified um, representation? Uh, because if there is a unified representation, we have some hope of being able to decode, uh, let's say, a sentence uh, if the original stimuli that was shown to the user, uh, to the subject, was uh, was basically uh, an image, right? So that's that. So um, essentially, uh, I already talked about these views earlier, but then let's basically just look at them again. This is the bird concept that we want to show uh, to the to the participant, and we can show it in the form of sentences or pictures or word cloud. There are other concepts also. So, uh, you know, if I think about this representation, this is concept plus sentence view. It's a bird plus sentence view. Um, so in this particular data set, this is a Pereira data set that I was talking about. 
In this data set, some subjects were actually shown the concept bird and then these six sentences. Other subjects were shown the concept bird. Uh, you know, there was a word, a bird uh, called uh, you know called bird shown to the shown to the participants and also a picture. Uh, and then the, uh, there were all some 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 of the subjects were shown this word cloud, right? Where the central word is basically the concept word. It was it was indicated to them pre, uh, early, uh, b before the experiment was started. Right? And then there are other examples also, like for the word wash, for the word unaware. You can actually have all the three views defined: concept plus sentence view, concept plus picture view, concept plus word cloud view. Okay. So what we did is the following, um, uh, or other you know, if I if you were to do brain decoding, how would you typically do? Well. You would uh, take the concept apartment and you take the picture. So this is basically concept basically plus picture concept plus. that is presented to the uh, subject, right? So the subject is, uh, you know, um, uh, thinking about it, and uh, you can actually capture their fMRI. Yeah. So the fMRI image that is basically uh, captured for the subject. Okay. Um, on the uh, and, and then you can actually process it using your favorite pipelines and essentially try to decode uh, what was it that the uh, that the that the you know uh, participant was being um, yeah. you could try to decode it to the text semantic representation of the word apartment of course in recent models now you know this is work uh, done in 2018 2019 uh, i mean the typical decoding works but more recent decoding kind of uh, uh, papers actually can generate the word apartment as well. But here, most people uh, before 2022 or were, were just trying to come up with a semantic presentation. So, so the idea is that, yes, you can take the same word called apartment or you can feed into a transformer model or BERT model, get the representation, and hopefully, you know, as part of decoding, you'll be able to take this image and, uh, you know, be able to decode it to the semantic representation. So that's brain decoding. So that's brain decoding. Um, now, uh, if the input was concept plus sentence, no problem. You would basically have a sentence. You would have a concept that was shown to the participant. And again, you'll have fMRI activations. Uh, the, the target does not change. Target is still the text representation for the word apartment as obtained using BERT model, right? But then the view changed. So this time, rather than actually uh, using the concept plus picture view, you're using a concept plus sentence view, right? So now, uh, sure, so uh, you can, of course, train individual brain decoding models, but can we train a universal decoder? By universal decoder, we mean that it can actually take right. any of these inputs, whether it is a fMRI actually obtained using a concept plus sentence view or fMRI obtained using concept plus picture view. So can I basically train a uniform, uh, uh, a universal decoder such that it can act on whatever kind of uh, brain MRI, uh, you know, fMRI information that you give me? Um, but before that, I need to also know how to measure accuracy of such models. So, you know, uh, I actually have uh, a rigid regression model and maybe, you know, some other things in the decoder, which finally give me a vector. But how can I say that this vector is close to the vector generated for the word apartment or not? How do I measure the, my accuracy? So in brain decoding world, uh, typically people use various popular metrics like pairwise accuracy. So what they say is the following. Well, if I have two inputs, for example, an apartment. So, if this sentence was was presented to the uh, to the participant, an apartment is a self-contained home that is part of a building, right? And the concept was apartment. And there is another input where the concept is building. Now, the idea is that if the uh, fMRI was generated when the subject was shown apartment, you know, its vector after decoding should be closer to the apartment vector rather than the building vector. Similarly, if the subject was shown a building, uh, a sentence containing building, then it's decoded, uh, you know, semantic vector uh, or decoded vector should be close to the building uh, vector uh, rather than rather than the apartment vector, right? So it's basically defined it's basically as, you know, defined as, you know uh, uh, define it as one if effectively uh, the correlation between the actual semantic vector versus, uh, you know, if, if the correlation between the text semantic vector for yi, uh, and the decoded semantic vector uh, for 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 building itself, the YI itself is closer, um, and and the, for the other and, pair as well compared to the uh, to the mismatched pairs, right? So correlation between the matched pairs should be higher than the correlation between the mismatched pairs. Okay, that's pairwise accuracy. The other way of doing this is rank accuracy taken from the retrieval world. So the idea is that yes, if you basically if your input contained the word apartment. You essentially decode and you come up with a decoded semantic vector. Now, this decoded semantic vector should be very close to the um, to the semantic vector uh, for the word apartment rather than semantic vectors for other words, right? So, essentially, if you had like semantic vectors for thousand words and your decoded semantic vector was on rank five when you sorted by similarity, 
then you would say, well, my rank accuracy is, uh, um, you know, um, uh, so, so basically it is a, an equivalent measure to MRR, which is popularly used in the retrieval world, right? So essentially the higher the rank, if it is at rank one, you would say rank accuracy is one. If it is basically lower down the rank order, you basically say rank accuracy is bad. Manish, so how are you calculating um, uh, multiple meanings of a word? Oh, uh, good point. So all of these words are chosen in a manner that they uh, that they are very disjoint. So they uh, don't have any uh, any overlapping meanings in that sense. So I do notice apartment and building can be multiple meanings, but they don't have, in fact, uh, those uh, um, those. Uh, so so if they have the word apartment, they don't have the word building in the in the data set basically. So that's that. Um, so that's that. That's that part. So that's we've part. talked about vanilla de decoding, right? Now let's talk about multi-view decoding. Multi-view decoding basically means that uh, uh, you have uh, your training model uh, on uh, in a, a multi-view decoder model. Let's say on the word cloud view, right? So you basically show word cloud and the concept. So basically something like this, and you have the fMRI activations. And at test time, you no longer test it just using the word cloud view. You in fact tested using sentence view, picture view, word cloud view, all of them, right? So basically, you assume that hey, maybe word cloud view is the best. So if I basically train my model on word cloud view, maybe I can make it work for all the three views at test time, right? And you can try to do that with all the three views. And the uh, curiosity that we had is uh, which of these views, if used for uh, training your decoder, can lead to very good accuracy when tested with any of the other views, right? So that's basically the multi-view decoding problem. Um, and here are the results that we obtained, right? These are complex, but I'll sort of uh, uh, try to make it super simple by going over them one by one, okay? So what you see here is uh, the accuracy of the models when they are trained using the picture view. What you see here is the accuracy of the models when they are trained using the sentence view. And these are the accuracy of the models when they are trained using the word cloud view. And now the purple color, uh, or rather let's call it the blue color, right? Blue color, uh, red color, and green color indicate where, what is the testing done on. So sure, these two are trained using the picture view, but is the testing done on picture view or sentence view or word cloud view, okay? So that's that. So basically it's more like, you know, if you know about cross domain kind of literature, it's similar, right? I mean, I trained on some data set and I'm testing on some other related data set. How well it does it perform, right? So, uh, so that's that, right? So essentially the three colors indicate the three views at test time. Okay. Now, if you notice, and, and what is shown per chart, well, uh, here is pairwise accuracy being shown, here is rank accuracy being shown. So you could practically just look at one of them, but uh, you know, if you really want to look at, you can look at both of them, right? Uh, and then we are showing results using BERT, okay? So what do you observe? So let's just look at the BERT result. The other results, BERT random, basically are there just to show you that yes, the, the BERT model is learning something. It's not like it's just taking some random representation and still it is able to decode in the same accurate with the same you know pairwise accuracy or accuracy. It's learning something. Okay. So so that's more for the reviewers who basically uh, you know ask that hey, uh, uh, is your model learning something or not, right? But the main uh, fun part is basically in the BERT model results. Okay. So what do, you what do we observe? We also surely observe that if you train the model on word plus picture view, of course you get better results with word plus picture view, big deal, right? But the nice part is that even if you train the model using sentence view, it gives you really good results on word plus picture view. Right? That's the nice part, okay? Uh, further, what we observe is that if you take the word cloud view, uh, you train the model on word cloud view, but you are testing it on word cloud view, it gives you poor results. Actually, you get much better results if you train the model on sentence view, okay? So those are little non-intuitive. So overall, you know, this, this experiment, what we found is that typically if you present word clouds to people, they won't understand much. If you present pictures to people, they understand better. If you present sentences to people, they understand somewhat. But if you present, you know, word cloud, uh, you know, the signal is pretty fuzzy. So. Uh, it sort of correlates also with our human understanding. Uh, typically, people understand picture is worth uh, is is worth a lot. So yes, they understand way better with the picture. Right? So the idea is that if you basically train a model using decoding data for pictures view, you are uh, you, 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 you are highly likely to to be successful in training a universal decoder model. Okay, so that's the takeaway. Uh, we also uh, looked at uh, the spread of informative voxels. So since we are training these models, so uh, you know uh, the BERT model was the base, and then we had a ridge regression on top of the embeddings so as to come up with the decoding. Um, 
So we could also look at uh, feature, you can do feature selection and therefore look at which were the informative voxels in this entire uh, entire entire decoding task, right? So we looked at the distribution of informative voxels across four different brain areas. So these brain areas relate with different kinds of uh, processing, like semantic processing, language processing, uh, processing uh, you know related to attention or salient information, uh, visual processing, right? So visual processing is super simple to understand. Language processing is the language processing. And then there are DMN and TP, uh, DMN and task positive areas, which relate with semantic processing and attention or salience information processing. Right? So as you see here, these are language subregions, these are visual subregions, and this is DMN, and then this is task positive. So we looked at where are the informative voxels spread, uh, you know, when we were doing this universal decoder kind of a setup. Okay? So what we observed. Uh, is that uh, the region corresponding to language processing? So you see, uh, you know, these ones and these ones, uh, especially the one in the left hemisphere. So if you look at this one, left hemisphere has higher informative voxels than those of the uh, of the, of the right yeah. hemisphere. So essentially, uh, what you observe is that, uh, especially when you are looking at the sentence view, and this basically gives us a very good feeling uh, that we are doing the right thing because. When you show sentences to people, yes, I mean, you know, the language regions, what people traditionally have believed are the language, really, really, uh, language regions, they fire up a lot. And uh, this also holds up with the, uh, with the existing theory, which says that your left hemisphere actually is much more powerful in terms of language compared to right hemisphere. And we saw that the percentage of informative voxels for the language region were more in the left hemisphere as well. Now, uh, again, what was nice to see is that uh, all of these visual regions uh, fire up a lot when we actually have word plus pictures view. This is very, very obvious and very, very uh, confirming in some ways, right? Um, uh, so a visual uh, network dominates as in the case of WP view and the majority of these are located. So the majority of these are located in the object processing area. <laughs> now, this could be an artifact of the kind of data set we have because the data set is really focused on single objects. They are not seen kind of images. So data set just contains like a phone or a bottle and things of that kind. They're not seen images, and therefore, possibly in this data set, when we processed, we saw um, you know the the uh, the vision, the object processing area of the vision uh, uh, being activated a whole lot. Okay. Um, now the other fun part was to ask this question about cross view decoding, right? And uh, uh, this is another experiment, and the way the experiment is designed is as follows. Um, let's say if the subject basically, uh, you know, saw uh, this image, right? Saw this image and we have the fMRI activations for this image. Great, right? And uh, uh, imagine that the subject was trying to then think about something, right? So basically maybe we asked the subject to do a caption and the caption was a colorful bird sitting on a tree branch. Okay? So which parts of the brain are involved in coming up with a bird representation of this sentence? So if we were to take the fMRI activations when the subject saw this image, we assume that the subject uh, sort of uh, uh, you know thought about this thing, a colorful bird sitting on a tree branch, which basically look it looks like, right? So if this if the subject was thinking about that, which parts of the brain, uh, you know, if we basically uh, take those that the, the brain activations, which are the most informative voxels, which lead to really awesome decoding of uh, uh, you know uh, decoding to the sentence, decoding to the sentence. So, and in other words, basically this is the image captioning task. Right? And similarly, you know, with this picture view keyword uh, and, and word cloud view and so on, you can design other tasks. For example, if I was showing this particular image, right, to the subject, what are the keywords that the user thinks about? What are the things that the person, the, 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 the keywords that, you know, and this is coming from the word cloud view. So what are the keywords the person is thinking about? Right? If, I, if, the, if the person actually saw this word cloud, right, what kind of a sentence they can form from this word cloud? And as you as you notice, right? These are different modes. This is picture to uh, keywords, uh, and we call it the image tagging uh, the task, right? This is basically word cloud to sentence, and we call it sentence formation task, right? Of course, this was image to sentence. We call it the image capture task. And the fourth task is basically, you know, uh, there is a sentence. We saw this. We showed the sentence to the user, and we basically asked them to come up with keywords in that sentence, in, or rather, uh, take the fMRI and try to predict uh, representations of keywords. Okay, this is a keyword extraction task. Keyword extraction task, right? So this is a very interesting task. Nobody actually had for earlier looked at, uh, uh, you know, the the part of brain sort of involved in doing in doing these cross modal kind of tasks. Whether you talk about uh, uh, you know, picture mode combined with text, uh, combined with the uh, uh, keywords, or essentially uh, full sentences, or word cloud mode combined with full sentences, and so on. So, uh, Manish, uh, I saw a paper recently that uh, said that um, 
uh, showing the image was a lot more effective than words uh, in, in memory standing. Is that something you found? Oh, yes, yes. So um, uh, that we found, uh, that, yeah, yeah. I mean, so that was not something that we looked at in this paper, but yes, in other works, we have also found the same thing. In this paper, in the previous part that I showed, right, we found that, yes, the picture view is, uh, uh, you know, yes, it activates brain activations in a way such that it, it can act as a good universal decoder. But yes, in other pieces of work, we have basically seen that the brain activations are much higher when you show people picture mode. So that's that. In this cross-view decoding yeah, task, yes, we were trying to essentially see how does, first of all, the accuracy come up. So in the sense that are we able to actually decode in the cross-view? So basically saying, uh, um, you know, imagine a user interface of this kind uh, that you saw something. Uh, so, so this is a demo that I uh, that I show to people, right? I don't know if, uh, uh, let me sell a little bit of Microsoft things here, okay? So, uh, 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 I'm not sure how many of you basically uh, uh, believe in, uh, uh, in in dictating things these days. So five five years back, uh, I tried dictation tool in my in, in Word, and that screwed up completely, right? But uh, 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 but in today's world, when I essentially uh, uh, when I essentially have to type long emails, uh, sorry, this is a little slow. I expect it to be slightly faster. Uh, but when I need to type emails, I no longer type them, right? So I basically just dictate those things. It's just taking too long to open. I think because I'm screen sharing and so on. Uh, oh, and it opened up some random thing which I didn't want to show up. Uh, yeah, but uh, in today's world, uh, if you think about it, uh, the speech recognition tool is super awesome. So I can actually control, um, um, you know, whatever I want to type rather than typing, I can actually speak that, right? But imagine a futuristic world where um, imagine a futuristic world where you just see something, right? You see something and uh, you want uh, whatever you thought about it to be typed automatically. Okay. So you see something and you want it to be typed automatically. Is that even possible? Right? That's the question that you were asking. And uh, what we found, yes, that is possible. So that's actually possible with very good pairwise accuracies. So, I mean, of course, these are very preliminary results. We are in the game of research, right? I mean, we're not in the game of really creating products right now. But the idea is that, yes, this is very much possible. So uh, in, in controlled settings, for sure, with this Parera data set, we found that image captioning has very good pairwise accuracy. In fact, very good rank-wise accuracy also, right? And, and so on for other tasks. Of course, sentence formation task is difficult. So if I basically showed you some keywords and then uh, you saw those keywords and can I write a sentence based on those keywords automatically based on what you were thinking? Uh, yeah, that's a little difficult. But uh, uh, the, the idea is that, yes, uh, there are results which show that image captioning, for example, is very much possible by just looking at what this guy thought, right? Not looking at the real image, but just look at what this guy thought when the guy saw the image. Um, if you look at abstract images, uh, nobody thinks the same, right? You think separate, differently from different people. So what you think is what has to be transcribed. And fortunately, that is all possible. Okay. Uh, I'll skip some results. We also try to, yeah, oh, rather, uh, this is interesting results. I should not skip them. So we were also interested in knowing when you basically are doing image captioning tasks, which parts of your brain are activated. So, and it does look like that when you're doing image-based tasks, image-based regions actually are very powerful. So region-based regions, so you see uh, the blue and the red things are actually higher in the vision part. However, if you look at keyword extraction or sentence formation tasks, their language regions are involved a lot and also demon and task positive regions, which have to do with semantic processing in that sense. There are more results in the paper, but uh, you know, for the sake of simplicity in this talk, I'll sort of skip over them so that I can talk about other things. So in conclusion, in this uh, in this work, we were really interested in figuring out, uh, uh, can you build a universal decoder? That is the first question. And second question, you know, when you're doing, uh, uh, are, are cross-border tasks even possible? So if you basically show someone images, if you look at their fMRIs, can you decode in text what they were looking at, right? So, and and uh, if so, which parts of your brain are involved? Uh, so that was this work around. The second work that I'm going to talk about is visual linguistic brain encoding. And here, the main idea is to do brain encoding. Remember the First one was on brain decoding. So really geared towards building awesome products if you really want to, right? But uh, this one is about brain encoding, visual linguistic brain encoding. This is about being able to accurately predict brain activations uh, given the stimulus and uh, specifically multimodal stimulus, right? So here we were basically um, in, in, you know, chasing for high accuracy. So we basically said, uh, sure, there are multimodal data sets and they have shown some accuracy in terms of being able to predict uh, 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 predict the fMRI activations really well, can we do better, right? 
And uh, in this work, uh, the goal was to basically make use of uh, recent uh, advancements in uh, multimodal deep learning uh, and uh, take them to neuroscience and uh, see how, how much can we push the barrier. Yeah, uh, that's that. So uh, um, so uh, what is brain encoding? Well, brain encoding, uh, as I mentioned, is the task of taking the, uh, taking the stimulus representations and uh, essentially uh, using, uh, I mean, taking the stimulus, taking the stimulus and uh, building some models, deep learning models, and then on top of that, putting up rigid regression so as to be able to regress to the brain activations. Okay, so, so as to be able to regress to the brain activation. So yeah, the target is brain activations themselves, right? So of course, what can we do? We could uh, try out uh, various models and we were, remember using multimodal data sets here. So we have the text part, we have the image part. part image. So of course you could pass the text part through typical transformers and uh, image part, you could pass it to through vision transformers. Uh, by 2019, 2000, uh, well, this work was done in 2022, just last year. So, of course, vision transformers are also very popular compared to dense net, rest net, and so on, right? Uh, or you could basically pass it to multimodal transformers. This is the first time that we basically, anyone in neuroscience actually tried out multimodal transformers. We wanted to basically check out if multimodal transformers are also powerful in terms of doing uh, good brain encoding. So we actually took this uh, stimulus, which is effectively multimodal in nature. So here you just see the picture, but there is text also associated with it, which is essentially shown here. This is the text part of the stimulus. So the text which is shown and there's a picture which is shown and you want to do the appropriate encoding, right? So you could process the text part, um, you know, through image transformers, or you could also process them through some cross-modal representations, cross-modal representations like visual bird, will bird and so on, right? Um, now, to be able to process them through these kinds of transformers, uh, typically Visual Bird and Wilbert take the images, uh, split them into different pieces, and for each piece, they try to figure out, I mean, well, they get the piece using faster RCNN, so you do object recognition, and you recognize that this is a racket, this is a hand, or this is whatever, right? So essentially, you get those pieces, and you pass them to these transformers. Um, again, in the uh, brain encoding neuroscience world, there are metrics so as to measure how good uh, you are in terms of uh, predicting brain encodings. Um, um, although I did not talk about them, uh, the predictions are at voxel level. So there's, uh, you know, uh, just like you have pixels in the 2D world, in 3D world you have voxels, and you have magnitudes of those voxels which you have to predict. So uh, so there are these two metrics which are popular, PSN correlation and 2v2 accuracy, right? Uh, which is what we were trying to do. Um, so we, of course, use CNNs. So all kinds of traditional CNNs, VGNet, ResNet, Inception, uh, V2, uh, Efficient Net, all of those uh, that basically you know are popular uh, from a traditional CNN perspective. We looked at image transformers, as I already showed to you. So VIT, Beat, uh, DEET, all of those popular image transformers, which had become popular by 2021. Uh, yeah. Um, and then we leveraged multimodal transformers uh, um, all the way to CLIP. So LXMERT, Visual Bird, and and CLIP. Um, uh, the data set is a Pereira data set. So one of them is Pereira data set. So which we already talked about yeah. where you are shown a concept uh, and there are sentences also, and you have picture. So you have essentially a nice cross-modal uh, multimodal data, right? And you have fMRI uh, that is recorded for this multimodal data. So that is the one thing that we leveraged. Uh, but uh, as I told you, these are just object images. They are really focused on objects, bird object, you know, tomato as an object and so on and so forth. They're not much about scene images, right? So therefore we leveraged bold 5,000 data, which is basically about scene images. It actually contains uh, uh, it, it's a combination. So it does contain some of those uh, uh, typical uh, object images only, but a whole bunch of them are scene images. You see them. And also a lot of them are images from the MS Coco data. So the caption comes oh, naturally yeah. therefore. So we took this uh, these two multimodal data and experimented with them. So what I'll talk about is the experiments and the observations we had. Right, uh, but of course I'll also talk about this accuracy. So two v two accuracy two is very similar accuracy. to the uh, pairwise accuracy that I mentioned earlier. But remember, pairwise accuracy was uh, defined uh, for decoding task. Two v two accuracy is also defined in a very similar manner, but this is defined for the encoding task. So here. The idea is that uh, when you're encoding, you come up with a representation, a voxel representation, uh, uh, which has been decoded, uh, which has been encoded. So from the stimulus, you come up with a uh, uh, representing the magnitudes for each of the voxels. And you have the actual vector, right? Which you have the actual vector. So you find the cosine distance between those two vectors. Now, the idea is that if you showed dog to the user, you must be able to come up with a vector which is closer to the world, to, to, the, to the actual dog vector, right? 
And if you showed house, it should be closer to the predicted brain activity for house. So if that happens, then uh, you know uh, you actually get a point, else you don't get a point. So the way the metric is defined is actually pretty similar to pairwise accuracy. It's just that in this world, it's called, uh, in the brain encoding world, it's called P2, right? And the target here is brain activations versus for pairwise accuracy, the target is really the semantic representation of various words. Okay, so how do the results look like? Uh, so this is on bold 5,000 and the results look similar for the other data set also, therefore I've not shown them here, right? So what are these results for, right? So first of all, the top row is for Pearson correlation, the bottom row is for 2v2 accuracy. So again, right. yeah, there are two metrics and uh, they actually behave more or less in a similar trend, right? The trend is pretty similar, okay? Um, what you also observe is that there are several bars. Uh, so uh, these things which are shown are different uh, brain areas. So different areas of the brain, early visual area, uh, OPA, PPA, um, so and RSC. Again, I'm not so great at uh, these areas. Uh, in fact, uh, one of my students, Subba, is uh, uh, you know he's essentially right now at Indria uh, and might look out for postdoc positions this year. Uh, but uh, uh, you know he's very good at these brain areas. So all I know is deep learning, right? But uh, he knows these <laughs> neuroscience things uh, very well. So so this is basically the things shown for these brain areas. Um, uh, so accuracy across different brain areas. Because hey, remember you are trying to uh, trying to uh, predict the brain activation for the entire brain. You may want to look at how well do you predict for different parts of the brain, right? So that's that. Um, and again, since we are talking about uh, a multimodal from a, a vision and uh, uh, and and text perspective, and these stimuli were obtained by a person seeing the stimuli, right? Therefore, we are only looking at text and visual areas. Uh, in other pieces of work that we did, we also looked at speech areas, speech processing areas, audio processing areas. But here, we are only looking at those brain areas which deal with text and 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 images. Okay? Um, okay. Now, the yellow group essentially is multimodal transformers. The green group is image transformers. Uh, the blue group is pre-trained CNNs, and uh, uh, then um, the the uh, the, the purple group is lit fusion models. So lit fusion models basically mean um, in an ad hoc way, you fuse the modalities. So basically for images, you use inception model, efficient net model, ResNet model, and whatever. For text part, you use Roberta model and you fuse the embeddings at the end and then do ridge regression in that sense. Okay. Um, and the yellow one and the light yellow one basically is essentially, uh, you know, pre-trained text transformers plus Roberta. So, uh, uh, or rather, you know, just the Roberta. So it basically ignores the vision uh, modality completely, the light yellow one, right? And it's just there to basically compare. How does it compare? Okay. So as you see, of course, the golden ones are the best. So the first thing, of course, to observe is that multimodal models typically do well compared to other models across various regions, except for a few regions where, you know, they can be comparative to pre-trained CNNs. But in most of the regions that you observe, multimodal models are doing really Specifically, when we compared clip, LXMOD, and visual bird, we actually found visual bird to perform the best. Okay. Other multimodal models also perform reasonably well, uh, you know, but, uh, 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 but, but, you know, comparable to image transformers. But visual bird, in general, we saw statistically significantly to be way better. Right? Uh, we also observed that uh, there are these late visual areas. So these these areas, PPA, uh, early visual, and OPA are like some of them are late visual areas versus early visual areas and so on. So the late visual areas, OPA and LOC are late LOC. visual areas, scene related and object related, and they display a higher Pearson correlation with multimodal transformers. Okay. Now, again, a higher uh, uh, correlation here is very nice because uh, we were showing areas and uh, also object related uh, stimulus in this data set. So in Parira data set, we did not observe uh, this uh, um, significantly higher kind of things, uh, have a significantly higher correlation happening for the late visual areas. Right? Um, so that's that. Now, again, for these representations, uh, some of these representations are patch based representations versus uh, uh, versus pooled representation. So the idea is that when you take a transformer, you could basically take uh, for every patch representations and then you can pull them or actually you can just take the CLS token. That's the difference. And what we observed is that the patch representation shows improved results compared to pooled representations. And that sort of goes, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, so so essentially, uh, although in typical transformer-based world, you just take the CLS token. Here we actually observe that if you look, look uh, took, you know, each of those patches and then you pull, pull them manually compared to taking the CLS token, those patch-based representations gave you slightly better results. But they were not statistically significantly better for all the areas. Uh, however, visual bird being the best, statistical, statistically significant. Right? There are similar results for Pereira. And for sake of time, I'll sort of ignore that. Yeah. 
We're also looking at uh, model size versus yeah. efficacy. So uh, what we observe here is that uh, uh, our visual bird model is uh, pretty small in that census. Uh, and uh, I mean, compared to other models like Clip or LXMART, right? So on the y-axis, you see uh, the, the size of the model. On the x-axis, you see uh, accuracy in some ways, Pearson correlation, right? So for both the data sets, we observe that, uh, you know, a visual bird model gives you reasonable accuracy uh, while being smaller in size. Now, you know, uh, yeah, the, the, the size may not matter much uh, at this point, but imagine if you were to really build it into real products, then the size of the models will actually matter if you really want to take these models uh, and build products around them. Okay. Um, uh, we also were uh, interested in other kinds of questions like is linguistic information important in the multimodal transformer world? Uh, and uh, uh, what we did was to actually take the correct image text pairs and try to do predictions versus randomize the image text pairs and do predictions. So these are essentially, again, these experiments are just there to show that, well, I mean, the correlations that we observe here are much higher. So they don't really, uh, so basically they're not random. They're still, uh, you know, based on the correct image text pairs. Okay. And uh, uh, what is being shown are the Pearson correlation values. What we observe is that uh, for visual part model, it actually gives you good results, not just for the visual areas, but it also gives you very good results uh, for, for the linguistic areas. So essentially saying that, yes, there is good linguistic information, uh, which plays an important role even for multimodal, uh, and, and that can be captured in multimodal transformers. Okay. Um, uh, there are other interesting, so these, these, these charts basically show you uh, the correlation values for different uh, sub areas. So now these are not just limited to the few language areas that I showed you on the previous slide. These are uh, more uh, thinking around particular sub areas. And um, uh, by looking at these, again, this requires some uh, real cognitive neuroscientists to actually look at these and make some reasoning around them. Right? So for example, um, um, some of these are actually very, very interesting. So um, uh, what you see, this one, this one is actually a very interesting finding. Uh, Professor Bapi Raju from IIIT Hyderabad, he has been like in cognitive neuroscience forever. And even before deep learning came in, right? So when he looked at some of these charts, he could really relate them with some of the existing theories that neurologists have had and could relate them with uh, uh, these findings that we have made uh, by looking at these charts. So one of the things was that for multimodal, uh, you know, uh, for multimodal integration areas, you have second best highest correlations. So these are correlations. So in the sense, how well can you predict uh, the brain activations in certain brain areas? And then people traditionally have believed that certain areas, uh, these, these particular areas that are named here, I won't even attempt to uh, you know, read them out, but these areas actually are related with multimodal processing. And we did see, I mean, well, not the best correlations, but second best correlations, meaning they are reasonably high correlations. What this means is that now we have models, multimodal models, which can take the fMRI activations and based on, uh, or, or basically take the stimulus and then uh, you come up with representations which can help explain the brain activations that are happening in those so-called multimodal areas, right? So again, which basically points out to our understanding that yes, the way the brain processes things, although we are probably not following the exact principles of uh, how the cells are organized and how those neurons are organized, they process things. But uh, even if we look at it from a white box perspective, uh, 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 you know, essentially, uh, uh, sorry, uh, from black box perspective, meaning, you know, we don't know how it internally works. Even if we don't know how it internally works, we are able to match, uh, uh, you know, uh, the overall observations at the end of it. Okay, so that's basically the takeaways. So in conclusion here in this second work that I talked about, we studied the effectiveness of multimodal models. This was the first time that we showed that multimodal modeling uh, using uh, models like visual bird clip and so on could lead to better brain encoding. Uh, and we found visual bird to do well. Uh, we also experimented with gold 5000 and parallel data sets and uh, were able to confirm some of the neurological uh, theories, uh, old, older theories with real data using deep learning. Okay, so that's my talk mostly uh, I'll quickly spend uh, maybe like uh, two minutes on other neuroscience work that we do. Uh, so cognitive neuroscience, uh, uh, you know, uh, we basically have also looked at NLP representations. So people, of course, recently have started trying to see, uh, can you do brain encoding using uh, uh, recent transformer models, right? Uh, and how can you improve the brain encoding accuracy? So older models, of course, used features extracted like linguistic features, part of speech tags and so on. We experimented with uh, transformers like BERT and GPD and so on, but not just that. We also tried to look at fine-tuned representation. So you take BERT, fine-tune it on named entity cognition task, and then try to see, can it predict the brain activations better? <laughs> so fortunately, we were able to observe that named entity cognition task, co-reference resolution, and shallow syntax parsing 
these tasks help you predict the brain activation the best. Basically saying that whatever the model learns by using data from named entity recognition is the best predictive of the way our brain actually works and processes language information. So that was one of those things, and we delve deeper into it. So we further wanted to figure out uh, if you take certain representations of the kind, you know, as expect as 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 uh, as uh, found using constancy parsing or dependency parsing or incremental top-down parsing, which of these parsers give you representations that align with the brain uh, the most, right? Uh, further, you know, after that we switched to uh, recently we've been working on speech, so um, looking at audio stimuli. And then doing similar kinds of things that, hey, if you take audio stimuli, and this time we really wanted to do an exhaustive job. So we tried to figure out all kinds of audio models that are available and uh, try to figure out which of these models are the best aligned with the way uh, our brain processes audio, right? Um, and uh, similarly, uh, you know, just like we tried to figure out which tasks are best aligned. Uh, so we found that name entity cognition is the best aligned task uh, based on our linguistic processing. We tried to find which of the speech tasks are the best aligned. And this time we uh, looked at several tasks like phoneme recognition, ASR, and so on. And we found that automatic speech recognition actually aligns the best uh, with the way that our auditory systems work. So, uh, so it basically best aligns with the, the uh, and, and is able to best predict the fMRI activations in the audio regions. So that's my presentation and I'll sort of stop it, stop here. Um, uh, I must credit Subba a lot for this presentation. He's the guy running the experiments. He's the guy doing most of this work. So therefore, um, every presentation that I make on neuroscience must credit him. Uh, uh, so if you have any questions, please feel free to uh, reach out to him as well. But otherwise, those are my contacts. I have a, a basic or naive question. Uh, does the brain activation mean uh, understanding, human understanding of concept? Yeah, yeah. I mean, being able yeah, to being brain activations is like uh, being able to, under, you know, uh, look at things the same way as the human brain looks at various stimuli, right? So, so there Why? are two parts: encoding and decoding. Why? And decoding, uh, I may have, I may have um, concept of bird, but uh, in my brain, I have, uh, I know of a lot of different birds, and um, you know, there is a. Um, uh, uh, you know, there will be uh, heron and there will be eagle and there will be um, uh, crow uh, in my brain. And, um, you know, they, each of them have certain distinctions. Um, yeah. Just, uh, you know, bird would not get me there at all. Yeah, yeah. So, so absolutely. So, uh, uh, so therefore, uh, in fact, there are more recent uh, pieces of work which basically take your representations and try to reconstruct the full image, right? Uh, now, the idea is that when you think about a heron and let's say uh, something which is very similar, so maybe, you know, uh, if, if it is very, very similar, then it's very difficult to predict because even you are thinking the same thing. But if you're thinking about a crow, you think about oh, my, some In my things. brain, even if they are similar, a uh, heron and a uh, flamingo, uh, they both, you know, stand still in the water uh, yeah. and both have long necks. Uh, my yeah. brain has uh, no problem in distinguishing the, the two. And I have actually, not only that I distinguish, I have, um, uh, uh, you know, I, I can pictureize uh, that I can, I see my heron in my lake behind my house, but uh, uh, I went to, uh, you know, this other place um, in Florida and saw, uh, you know, Flamingo. So uh, there is a lot more contextual information that my brain would have. And that's what is called understanding. Um, uh, not just the core recognition of concept. Oh, absolutely. So, I mean, uh, absolutely. In fact, so therefore the older act, older methods just try to compute these 2v2 accuracies and try to correlate. But more recent methods have tried to decode the full image. So there are pieces of work, very recent pieces of work where uh, not, not from, you know, not from my group or people working with me, but pieces of work which try to reconstruct the full image. So you're right, absolutely right. Just correlation is not enough. I mean, in fact, people have been actually generating whatever uh, is in, in the brain. Yeah. And they have been pretty, uh, I mean, pretty successful in doing uh, some of these things. Yeah. Specifically for very, very clear concepts. Now there are some concepts which are fuzzy abstract concepts. For them, it is difficult to reconstruct anything. In fact, what would you reconstruct anyway? But uh, for very clear concepts like Heron or Flamingo, it will just work fine. Uh, following okay. up on, uh, I will love to ask questions. Mm -hmm. uh, following up on uh, Amit's example with the flamingo in uh, in Florida, um, uh, are there experiments? Have experiments been made uh, in which the 
a subject is placed in a particular situation and shown uh -huh. the same image. Um, you know, I, I'm thinking of uh, the idea you show the same image, but in one case you say you are in the Everglades of Florida. In the other case, you say you are in a park in Kenya. Uh, a very nice, and, very nice uh, example. Yeah. Yes. And I wonder, do people do experiments like that to see how the brain activates differently in, in that case? Oh, absolutely. So not that I know of. Uh, I mean, you know, there are several settings possible, by the way, that people have experimented with. Right. So in fact, you know, in one of the earlier slides, I think I talked about uh, uh, those, those kinds of settings. Um, uh, so these kinds of differences. Right. Uh, this particular setting that you talked about, the context sensitivity, sensitivity of a particular word. I don't think people have experimented with. In fact, uh, um, how would you even define the experiment, right? So you would still basically just ask, uh, uh, here is a flamingo, right? Now you could basically show the picture and you can basically say, well, this is in Florida, right? But flamingo is a flamingo. Now, whether you see it in Florida or you see in Mumbai, right? It, uh, it, it is going to remain a flamingo. So, but the kind of variety of experiments that people have done, people have done things like, I will show you Harry Potter sentences. And by the way, at the end of it, I'm going to ask you a quiz question. And a quiz question sometimes is basically, you know, uh, uh, choose a, a, a or B, right? So basically multi-choice question, A or B, such that when the person is still in the fMRI scanner, they can essentially just make a choice by pressing a button saying the answer is A or B, right? So as to have them concentrated on the task. So there are these context sensitive tasks which are done for context sensitive experiments. Um, okay. Uh, in fact, people have also done experiments with disabled, pe uh, you know, with, with people with different kinds of abilities, right? So, for example, patients, some of the experiments were done with patients as well. Um, although, you know, an interesting experiment would be the one to do with dementia. Right? Essentially, uh, patients suffering from dementia, can you do experiments with them? Uh, unfortunately, there are not uh, enough data sets, as I would say. Although number of data sets are increasing day by day as we speak, uh, but uh, there are interesting settings for which, uh, for which there are not enough data sets. Uh, another interesting area is multilinguality. Unfortunately, most of the data sets are English only, right? Very few of them yes. are in other languages, but the same sentence, if I basically show it to bilingual users, what do they think when, uh, when I read, I can read Hindi and English. When I read Hindi, what do I think when I read English, do I think something different, right? So there are interesting settings and uh, unfortunately there's no multilingual data set of this kind. So, yeah. It's interesting that you mentioned patients, you know, yeah. um, here at the university, there is a, large lab working on aphasia patients you know oh, patients nice. who have had uh, you know strokes and uh, there is a lot of effort in trying to understand how to better help them regain um, you know the ability to speak and uh, so clearly so we have an edge funded project jointly with Ooh, uh, that group itself yeah, very good very good and i think uh, deepa is going to follow up and uh, connect with you on uh, you know on the possibilities there got it but um, all right well um okay go on and after that you know yeah yeah Mita. Huh? okay uh, -huh. uh thanks for the nice talk uh i do have a few questions about like in terms of neuroscience, how would you sell this work to neuroscience? Because these are all black box models. And it will not explain anything to them. It will not bring any benefit to them. No, no, no. So that's not completely true. So these are black box models. But you, uh, but in many of these pieces of work, we have uh, showed layer-wise results. So in fact, uh, uh, that's actually a very nice question to ask. So we have actually seen uh, how different layers capture different things. Uh, uh, you know, in fact, we've also tried to... Uh, try to separate out syntax versus semantics. So if you take a take transformer a model, can you basically, uh, from a BERT model, can you completely remove uh, the oh, semantic uh, information semantic. and then try to predict? So, and using, uh, uh, I mean, how, how do you remove semantic information or how do you remove syntactic information from a BERT model is, is, uh, is, is something. But if you can do that, then which part of brain, which brain areas does it uh, have a greater alignment with? And that tells you which part of your brain processes syntax versus which part processes which part semantics and so on. Yeah. So all yes, these are yes. black I, models, but you can still I do a understand all of those things. But there are uh, other analysis which uh, neuroscience people do, like functional connectivity analysis. They do it like by voxel by voxel, and they get all the activation with great accuracy. Uh, it is greater than the accuracy which you are getting. That work is there. Then uh, there is other other kind of work which depends on uh, 
uh, another set like analysis it's also voxel by voxel an analysis it's called uh, searchlight analysis you haven't compared your results with that and uh, this prior data data set which is being used for searchlight analysis as well as functional connectivity analysis so you haven't compared those results here and like if you are going to follow up these results i would like to see those comparison because neuroscience people will be able to understand these results more because in uh, functional connectivity and search analytics we have these areas which will give us the direct prediction like which voxel which brain region and uh, like in multi model prediction also like what are the predictions over there these all kind of analysis are there so oh, i don't I see mean, in any of your work like this has been compared absolutely yeah i mean you're right we have yeah. not compared with them and in fact i'm not very aware of these as well so do you mind sending an email i mean if you if you don't mind and you know you can just if you can send some pointers sure. about would be we would love to compare right and see yes. how they perform so but uh, i mean like yes. again some of these pieces of work we have worked oh, with, uh, work with uh, you know one of the collaborator is uh, she she graduated from princeton and now at mpi uh, the other collaborator is from triple it hyderabad so at least you know those guys are the ones whom i depend on for for, for all neuroscience knowledge so they didn't yeah, really so make i understand me, that so. this paper was in nakel and it's all about transformer let, model let me come in let me come in here so see manish okay so fantastic talk Uh, you know, great talk as always. So how it happens? You know, Deepa always presents something about this, and I always see, uh, say to her, "Ki look at Manish work. I'm really you know fond about what he is doing, and I keep telling that all the times. And then we had this idea. Okay, why don't you know we call Manish to have the talk and etc. So I believe uh, these questions. I mean, in different viewpoints and etc. You know, Deepa can follow up with you and yeah, you know sure. collaborate and blah blah blah. All lot possibilities oh, and etc. Sure. So oh, sure. that's great. i have some open ended you know question you can comment or you know we can take offline and this and that blah blah so first of all i'm really excited i keep seeing your you know work on this area i'm, I'm i also want to do something so my question number one i believe is is a connection with whatever professor said and you know other professor asked is uh, all the uh, analysis as of now probably on the caption kind of data which is relatively easier so if we go little complex let's say if we take news data set Uh, news mm -hmm. headlines and the news image and etc those you know we might be able to go in the complex part and slowly so that's you know open, again open and question second is uh, m density is giving the best representation so fantastic you know take away i mean i learned it really well but my question is why not machine translation kind of complex task uh, so that's you know my you know second question and i'm really excited about your idea uh, towards universal decoding so if we can really do that we can probably do universal decoding from machine translation as well and that would be a great thing so oh, your comments makes sense uh, oh so so on machine translation see uh, amita in that work we just compared uh, encoders so essentially we have to come up with some uh, representation from a transformer encoder right so therefore we didn't compare with machine translation so okay, and okay. again machine translation comparison makes a lot of sense when we are trying to deal with multilingual data now here there was basically just uh, english uh, uh, and and just uh, english things uh, which were shown as part of stimuli so that's that mm -hmm. uh, now the other part about can we come up with a universal uh, machine translation decoder um, very recently just this week in fact uh, meta ai put up uh, this, uh, uh, this nlp piece called as uh, the models called as seamless uh, m4t models so uh, they are literally you know uh, uh, multilingual uh, not just text to text translators but also speech to text and text to speech so text they basically speech. do all so of those basically... for 100 up to 100 languages so in nlp world yes people have made a lot of progress um in uh, yeah, yeah. neuroscience world unfortunately at least i don't know of data sets which uh, basically are are multilingual in nature great thanks just want yeah, to say something so yeah, yeah. you are just thinking about from a new uh, computer science domain nlp task mm -hmm. okay if we are including brain also we should also think about how we can incorporate these things into clinical clinical aspect so that neuroscience can also get benefits of that thing there is no disagreement right and and, and, and on that one right on on that one i think dementia patients are really important to study right what is the what is it that causes them to uh, so dementia is particular uh, disease where i think uh, uh, they can in general think a lot about most things but only a few entities they cannot really relate with so what causes that how do how do people uh, how do those patients selectively switch off certain brain areas 
right i think that's an interesting so thing you, that about if like, you want to see that you can look at the functional connectivity part because there are many studies which say that how these uh, brain connection turns on and off like okay. like there are two kinds of activation it's like long activation and the short activation in different brain regions so mm -hmm. actually there are studies which study that and you can find a lot of valuable work over there and then compare it with uh, what you are doing in decoding part Awesome, awesome. So great. I mean, would love to learn more neuroscience from you, um, and uh, you know, take this forward. Yeah. Any any further question we have? Uh, hello, sir. Thank hello, you very sir. much, Manish, for your time. It's a great talk. Hello, 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 sir, sir. Hello, sir, sir. Hello. Yes, yes, yes. Any oh. love? Okay. <laughs> there, are some, there are some questions. Yes. So in the interest of not working, the last question we can take. Yes, yes, please. Uh, yes. So, uh, so, like, this is not a question. Like, uh, I was really amazed with your uh, talk. So, thank you very much. So, here are my fellow team members as well, Anubhav and Swagata. So, and Shoham as well. So, recently, we have also picked up this task on brain decoding, where we were particularly interested on decoding thoughts from MEG images. So, the yes. thing is, we used the data set from University of S Southern California, where there were, like, 27 subjects. They were made to listen four different short stories. And based right. on that, their MEG activities were recorded. So there was mm -hmm. this hackathon where we participated in, where we actually tried to do that. So we basically took those images, MEG images. We also have the numerical data of the corresponding images, but unfortunately, we do not have the domain knowledge to actually process it and make it into a embedding or vector of any such kind. So we use the CNN features, and then uh, we also got the text embeddings from Roberta like a uh, pretend Roberta. And then we used a decoder architecture to actually try to map these things, like from these uh, feature em embeddings to the corresponding wave embeddings. And although the data set was not very large, it was about 190 uh, images. So we got a root score of about 0 0.58, root one. So, uh, so we are really interested in this work. And I also like connected you, uh, to you on LinkedIn and also sent a text a few days back. Uh, yeah. So here is Anubhav as well. So if possible, if we can actually do something about it or actually get help from you, we would really be very grateful because this is a topic we have been on for like since uh, since quite a long time and we are actually interested in moving forward with this. So here is uh, Anubhav absolutely. as well. I mean, open, open to collaborations, Neela. So I think, uh, yeah, I mean, I think uh, uh, Professor Amit, Amitava and Professor Amit both can sort of uh, uh, you know, discuss the first discuss with them and, you know, whichever, uh, you know, whichever think that we can, uh, whichever project we can move forward with, uh, we can actually start with, you know, maybe a collaboration. And especially, I think and I would love to I think I've also in all of this because he has been my partner in crime in all of these things. So, uh, <laughs> you know, yeah, I mean, like, like, I must say that like, like, my I interest, say interest in this area is just because of him. So, uh, therefore, it would be really nice to collaborate really with nice. all of us together and take this forward to answer more interesting questions. Yeah. Great. Great, Manish. Thanks again. And, you know, bye-bye. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, Professor Amit, for the invitation. And great to do this talk. Yeah. Okay. Bye. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Right now? Yeah, start with all already started. Uh, my, I've been uh, particularly uh, modeling and uh, interested in the, the phaser lab because my wife 